We were all the way in the book of Judges chapter 1 and had in there a, a, an understanding that God was just showing us what his power and his might was and how the people of Manasseh could actually not conquer the things that God had given them. And so as I went forward in trying to understand and analyze what that was, we were in Judges chapter 1, we said that there was a particular place that they did not conquer, and we called it Bethshan, which is the house of ease. Those of you who were here uh, last week, you know, that was not uh, an amen type of sermon, right? It was one of those that is like a knife that twisted in there somehow, uh, because it causes you to, to struggle with the things that, that keep us from fulfilling the call of God. And so Bethshan becomes that place that, that causes uh, the people of God to, 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 to stumble, if you like. And so now what, one of the things that, that the Lord, the Lord will, will speak about right there is that and it's in, it's in verse 27, by the way, uh, chapter 1, Judges chapter 1 and verse 27. Uh, and we dealt with this particular place, and, and we, were, we were just struggling with how it is that there are certain people in the kingdom of God that cannot conquer the house of ease. And we say that America is struggling with that, 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 uh, that the very meaning of that house is to be at ease. And the Bible speaks so clearly about woe to them who are at ease where? In Zion. He wasn't saying woe to them who are at ease out there in Babylon or over there in the Palestinian land or over here in the Egyptian land. He said woe to them who are at ease in Zion. He was talking about his own people saying that this trap can be something that, that causes a mighty struggle. And so, Bethshan then becomes that place that, that becomes a trap to the people of God. And I just um, uh, wanted to, to just revisit something here so that we can finish up the, the, this idea of how God does this. So, let, let's go and... Um, to the book of First Chronicles, chapter seven, um, and we'll come back right here to this chapter. But First Chronicles, chapter seven, um, and we'll see here what um, what the Lord is doing here. Verse twenty-nine. Verse twenty-nine. Here's the mark. The marking the borders of the people of Manasseh, the children of Manasseh. And I told you that Manasseh was that child of Joseph, the firstborn of Joseph, and how he has struggled to conquer the things that God had asked him to conquer. And so here's Manasseh in chapter 7 and verse 29. And by the borders, these are the borders of Manasseh, the borders of the children of Manasseh, Bethshan, that's the town that we've been talking about, and her towns, Tanak and her towns, Megiddo, and her towns, Dor and her towns. In these dwell the children of Joseph, the son of Israel. I want you to remember these two towns now. Bethshan, which is the one we've been dealing with, and Dor, D-O-R. That is another one of the borders of, of, of Manasseh. Bethshan and another one of the borders is Dor. Um, there will be another verse, we won't go to it, where it is said that one of the, ta the, the border towns was Endor. So Dor, and another place called Endor. Who will remember what Endor is in, in the significance of the Bible? Endor. Yes, that's the, the, the place of that witch. That's where Saul went to meet, meet a witch. Now, something interesting about this, just keep this in mind. Bethshan, the one that we talked about last week, and the one that we're reading about right here, is the place where they hung the body of Saul when Saul 
was killed by the Philistines, remember that? In that great battle, right after he met with the witch of Endor. The next day, in fact, when they killed him, they stripped his body, they, took, they cut off his head and took his body and hang him on Bethshan. That town, that's where they hang his body at. And if I can, I'll read you some of the passages that will take you there. But, but this is where you have to go. And there is so this place called Dor is one of the borders. Endor is another one of the border towns. And Bethshan is another one of the border towns of Manasseh. That's where we're dealing with right here. Now, you don't even have to remember all these names, but you will remember that which is the significance of how these things work in the kingdom. Now, we are then in the book of Judges, back to Judges chapter 1, and we will deal here with the things that Manasseh could not conquer, chapter 1, and verse 27. Are you there? He says, Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshan and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Ibliam and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites dwelt there in the land. Meaning they were not able to conquer almost anything. I mean, all the three places that he was told to conquer, he, he conquered not a whole lot. But I want to concentrate on Bethshan and Dor. And one of the things that I want to concentrate on is Bethshan as on what it is. It's a border. The house of ease. And I told you last time as we were talking that one of the greatest dangers in the life of believers, even from those days, is this inability to understand the capacity that living at ease has from stopping you. It is no accident that Manasseh had a border named the House of Ease. It wasn't even meant to be a border. And another time we can see the map. It was not meant to be their border. It was meant to be conquered. But they didn't conquer it. They didn't. Because of that, it became their border. That means this is how far I go. This is where I stop, where my conquering has stopped. Basically, what has come to pass with Manasseh is they, their border is only that which is easy. They cannot conquer whatever is hard. It's going to get worse today. I, I, I told you that. I'm out, by the way. I'm leaving, so you'd be glad. But, but, but one of the good things is I, I'm going to take my last shot right here, right now. I have seen this spirit fall upon a whole nation named the U.S. Entire groups can only conquer that which is easy. Manasseh is all excited when they give him the land. He says, look, you have to conquer this and conquer that. And he looks at all the other tribes as the tribes are going off to war and conquering places. And they're like, yeah, like people get all excited. Until you run into the fact that there are heavy enemies right there. Oh, I love to see the excitement. Don't get me wrong. I just... Trickle right here in your mind thinking, how in the world is this going to happen? It's not going to happen while you live in the house of ease. When you allow the house of ease to go unconquered, the only things that you can do in the kingdom of God is that which is easy. Whatever will bring a hardship will always be left for the next guy. Not only that, you will accommodate your doctrines so that they will tell you to your mind that the things that God wants you to do are only the easy things. There is a whole gospel called the prosperity gospel that has elements of truth in it because the Bible is very clear about it, but has elements that are not right. One of them is that you could never or should never confront situations that are difficult. That there should never anything bad happen to a good Christian. They should have told that to Jesus. He did not get that memo. 
It was, wasn't him the one kneeling over in that mountain, yelling out to the Father, pass this cup from me. Sweating blood. Nevertheless, let thy will be done, not mine. Meaning, this is hard. I don't know if I can go through with it, but I'd rather suffer through it and do your will than not do your will. I refuse, Jesus will say, to live in the house of ease. For if only what is easy for me is what gets accomplished, it becomes my border and I cannot get past that. I have a whole generation of missionaries right now who all they want to know is how easy it is wherever they want to go. I'm going to talk about my crew now because it's easier to do that. They, I get the questions. Can I plug my computer somewhere? If I can't plug my, is there a good internet service where we're going? I want to say, let, let me, come over here. Let me show you what internet service is. What do you think? All we see is monkeys and crazy things out here. There is no internet service. There is no service at all. There is no electricity. There's no running water. And we're out in that bush. It does not matter though. Because the kingdom of God is going to be conquered by those who desire to conquer it in the power of the God who we serve. God did not send us to do something easy. He sent us to do something impossible. For it is impossible for humans to do what we do. But we don't do it in the might of the human. We do it in the kingdom of God and the power of God. Oh, easy. Easy. Oh, I'm asked all these things. Don't get me wrong. I told you last time, when I take a crew with me and they're, they're going, I'm not talking about going on a, on a one week mission trip. That's good. That, 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 that will get your, your, your blood flowing. I'm talking about real guys who go live over there and they freak out on me. Oh no. You mean I'm going to stay here by myself? Whoa. You didn't tell me this. Yes, I did. Well, I didn't think you were for real. <laughs> what? I'm going to stay here? How long? I don't know, a year. A year. What am I going to eat? What if they want to kill me? What is going on? And the heart is going crazy. Boom, boom, boom. I say, ah, you understood wrong about the kingdom of God. When he said, take up your cross and follow me. He was referring to the, to the steps that Jesus took. To the walk that he took. To the desire that he took. He was not a wimp sitting in somewhere whining because he broke an nail. He was a man of men. And he walked this earth with that understanding. I will walk until God says to stop walking. I will live the life that God desires for me to live. And along the way there will be hardships. Along the way there will be easy times. But it doesn't matter. The border is not what is easy. The border is whatever God says as the border is and whatever he desires that's what I'm going to do no matter what it costs in my own life ah. a church like ours can become ineffective and it can become that a church that does nothing because it can only do what is easy and what is easy is not even needed because if it's easy somebody else can do it Oh, the border of Bethsan. This is the very death of Saul. For the beginning of his ministry, he's a fighter. Remember, he fights the Ammonites and he wins and he does mighty things. But as life begins to take over and he's the king, he begins to be a guy who can actually conquer everything just by going like this. I told you that I've had some of these experiences. It's really, really strange when people want to serve you this way. It's weird. There are places in Africa where they don't even let me, let, let me walk, you know, walk around with my Bible. They carry it for me. I said, give me my Bible. I can carry my own Bible. And they're like, no, man, you're, you're the man of God. Well, don't treat me this way in the valley. I can tell you that. <laughs> in fact, they might give me theirs. We'll carry mine too. I have an entourage. I'm telling you, entourage. I have like seven people who come pick me up. I mean, in cars where, I mean, I got picked up in the airport and they, they brought a whole convoy, you know, with, with limousine and flashing lights and all this other stuff. And I was like, all right, who is this all for? It's for me. All right, that's good. Let's go then. And I, I could see everybody just looking. I mean, that must be a great dignitary. You know what I'm saying? Look at that, the whole group. I remember getting in the car, and everybody's like, everybody got out of the way. I remember a cop coming, and he went to attention when he saw me. And he went, diplomatic immunity. 
I said he must have seen that in a movie somewhere because I haven't committed any crime, so I don't need any diplomatic immunity. But it's okay. I, I went like that too. Okay, right? That's good. <laughs> you clap and you say to people, I mean, they have all these servants that they put them right there. And they say, you know, you tell them whatever you need. I said, really? This is cool. Get on one foot. And I was like, what? Well, they told me, I mean, that's what I want. I mean, bring me water. I mean, they do these things, right? I can tell you something, though. When this begins to happen in the life of a person like Saul, the roughness and the toughness of the warrior begins to get eaten out. And all this softness begins to take over his life. To the point that when a giant comes screaming and yelling at the people of Israel and saying, bring me a man, bring me a man, the one man who was the warrior there, Saul, he says, where is that man? Where is he at? There's a giant there. I don't know what to do with him. And people are looking at him. In fact, you're the tallest guy, Saul. The Bible says that he was head and shoulder taller than anybody else. Yeah, he was a midget compared to the giant. But we're even smaller than you are. God, do this thing. You're the cold one. You're the anointed one. He says, no, 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 no. That's hard. Bring me a midget so I can fight him because that's easy. But that's a huge guy. I don't want to mess with him. I mean, they, what in the world? And so he sits around and he does not accept the call of God at that moment. Does not accept the desire of God because it is hard. What an interesting concept. <laughs> I cannot conquer it because I can only do things that are easy. Oh, there's nothing harder in the kingdom than working with a bunch of softies. Who, when they break a nail, they fall apart. Oh, look, I broke a nail. Jesus needs to come back right now. He goes, I'm suffering. Look at that. You think I'm joking. I have worked with plenty of people like that. And you're talking about souls on the balance, struggling, things happening all over the place. But the heart has grown soft. And all that. Now, I'm not talking to you about becoming a missionary and going to some rough place and do this or that. That's not what I'm talking about. Most of you guys are not called to do that. You're not supposed to do that. You're not even wanted to, be do, to do that. That's not what you're called to do. <laughs> but there are things in the kingdom of God that, 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 that there's a tremendous challenge for you. Things that are, will be very difficult for you to do. And then God whispers in your ear as you lay in your bed at night. And he says... When did I tell you that you are supposed to do this? And you begin to make excuses. I know God, but that's hard. If I tell that person, they're not going to talk to me ever again. If I struggle in that direction, it might hurt me for a while. Can we do something easier, God? Can we do something that is a little bit less rough? Nothing wrong with that prayer, by the way. But I already know the answer to that. I can give it to you. I'm, I'm just like this, like, like, like prophetic. He's going to say, no. I'm not a prophet, by the way. But he's going to tell you, you do what I tell you to do. Have you ever heard this one? It's hard. Hard, hard, hard. And you battle with God. You fight him. I remember when he told me to come here to the valley. I fought God for one whole year. I mean, fasted, prayed. I said, God, I don't like it there. He said, why? Because it's not Mexico, but it's not the U.S. either. <laughs> if you speak English to them, they speak Spanish to you. And if you speak Spanish to them, they speak English to you. And if you speak both, they go in the middle. I want to be there. I had this idea that I was going to be in the Amazon. See, I've read a lot of the missionary stories. So I went to the Amazon. That's how I was serving. I said, I'm, I'm in the Amazon. I don't want to go to the valley. What in the world? That's like you're demoting me. You're sending me back. <laughs> Nothing wrong with this place, by the way. 
It's just me as a missionary. You're like, yeah, I want to be in right smack in the middle where, where I need to be, where I want to be. And I remember him beginning to wrestle with me and me wrestling with him and saying, God, just keep me here. I like it here, Lord. This is what I want to be. Well, the piranhas can attack me. I like that. Where things are real, you know, where we, we can do this thing. And the kingdom of God does not take people who want to tell the chief what it is that you want to do. Until he says, I remember clearly when he told me. I was driving into Miami to get into a flight that moment. And he told me, you get on that flight, you go on your own. And so I got to the airport and turned around and drove all the way here. And I never left. Now, I am very happy to be here, by the way. Praise God. I'm very happy to be here. And I know now that God wanted and had a plan for me here. And it's been a tremendous blessing for me in any way, shape, or form that you can imagine. Number one, number one blessing that I have in this place is this church. I'm blessed here. I've been blessed here since then. I mean, I, I have. I've been, I've been blessed. It's been, it's been a good run. I mean, it's been, it's, been, it's, it's been crazy. Many of you guys are a little bit off, but it's okay. I fit here, I guess. All this craziness that happened in this house, up and down and all kinds of crazy things. Yeah, I don't know if you guys do, but I quit this church like five times already. And I came back ready next week because I can't find nowhere else to go. I know that the Word of God is moving in this place. I know that things are wrestling and things are happening and that the power of God is a challenge for all of us and I know that he has a plan for what God wants to do here and I know that he wants me to be a part of that and so I am all sold out for what God is doing and as we reach into the nations but I did not come easy here I fought him I said no God no what else did I not like I said they're rude I don't know what it is about us we're supposed to be hosp hospitable. It's, it's the South. You cannot get more South than us right here. But I think the hospitality kind of skipped. They stepped in San Antonio somewhere and didn't come back down here. You strive what I'm saying. Now, you guys live here, so you know, you know, this is life, so you don't notice it. But we who live from other places and come over, we notice it. You want me to show you how? You are in a store somewhere, and you're reaching for a particular garment, and people bump into you and grab it from your hands. And you stand in there, it's like, and they ignore you like you're not even there. Then you grab to another one, they grab that one too. We're in a restaurant not too long ago, and some lady grabbed her dirty dishes, came over to our table, and put it in front of us. Her dirty dishes. In my table. Then she said, I'm sorry, and walked off. And I said, why is she sorry? I'm the one with her dirty dishes. What's going on? Or try this. You open up the door to somebody who, you know, a lady who's walking in with a couple of kids, and they're going to walk right in. And you open up the door, and you're trying to be all nice like that. They don't even acknowledge you standing there. And if they do, they're like, I mean, do you exist? What's going on? You're used to that behavior. So you think, okay, that's how things are. That's not how things are. So I was like, God, why are you doing this to me? But I remember one of the beautiful things about what God does is he knows better. <coughs> in fact, I can tell you that I am who I am in the kingdom right now because I'm here. And that God has used all those things because there are a gazillion other good things here. One being, the food is good. <laughs> Can anybody say amen here? I tell you what, I will lie to you if I miss you most when I'm gone from here. I miss the food. <laughs> you can walk into any gas station and they have good tacos. You just see me up there when I'm like in some place up north, I was like... There's no tacos. What's going on? Did Jesus come back and I didn't notice? What is the problem here? 
Or you go to the restaurants that supposedly are Mexican restaurants. You're like, this doesn't taste like Mexican. Maybe it is real Mexican. Maybe one of them missing us Tex-Mex food. I don't know. Anybody who travels, you know what I'm talking about, right? You've been gone for a couple of weeks. You start thinking, man, Los Asados, this sounds good right now. Oh, the Hano girl. <laughs> Not just that, I actually have felt a stirring, and there is a gift that God has given to this area. I've, I've, I've noticed more Christian motives and things. I've walked into places where they're playing Christian music, and Christianity is beginning to take a hold of this valley, and I thank God for that. And long ago, praise God, long ago, I realized that God was stirring something up, and that he wanted to put me here and to allow me to be blessed by what he was doing. Because we can say all kinds of bad things, but he knows exactly what he wants. And where am I from anyway? I'm from a place that is a lot worse than here. You guys are just rude to each other. We shoot each other. <laughs> That's a little bit ruder, I think. <laughs> and not only that, you know, I'm complaining about this or that hot. I mean, this is hot here, but I mean... It's not compared to my place. We are hot every single day of the year. Close to 100 or over 100 every single day of the year. So, yeah, I come over here all sweaty, and everybody's like, wow, you know, that's a hot place as well. You haven't gotten to my place. Purgatory has nothing on Nicaragua. <laughs> We're good. I mean, we can, we, we. No, so I, I, I mean, if you're thinking that I'm complaining in the sense of I come from a better place, it's a lot worse where I come from. I'm just telling you something. When God decides to do something, he does not take into account whether you think it's easy or not. In fact, I suspect that whenever he finds something easy, he says, eh, no, I'm going to do it hard. You remember Gideon? Gideon comes over and he makes, blows a trumpet and he's like, whoa, come on, and we're going to go fight together. And the Bible says that 32,000 men showed up and God says that is too easy. Because you got 32,000 men, you're going to think that you did it. Let's cut it some. And they cut him to 10,000. You remember that? And all of a sudden, he's, you know, he's feeling like, okay, this is a little difficult now, God. I mean, this is a small army. We can still work it. God says, still too many of them. I want to do it in a way where it is impossible for you to do it. Now you can say, God is the one who did it. What am I saying? That whenever God decides that he's going to use you, he's going to put something in front of you. He's going to grab a church or a family. He does not sit around thinking, well, they don't like hot weather, so let me put them in, you know, kind of good climate. They don't really like this kind of stuff, so we're going to do that. Well, you know, I mean, they don't really speak the language, so I'm not going to do that with them. He does not do that. I wish he did. I've sent him a long list of my requests. Anybody here with me? This God will be the ideal right here. Let me tell you what it is that I need. I will need this, and I need that, and I need that. It's like he took it and did the opposite of whatever I told him. Every single thing I asked him, he gave me the opposite. And then when I get to it, and I want to be mad about it, when I find out that he was right, that he knows better, you know why I'm able today to reach into the whole world and go to all these places that God has placed in my plate? Because I'm not in the Amazons. There is nothing to go to the whole world in the Amazon from. The only, thing I can, the only thing I can do there is eat the fish and walk with the Indians there. But whenever I came here, there is all these airports that are really, really good airports. Right there in Houston, I can touch the whole world. And I can get in one right here in Harlingen and get to wherever I need to. He had a bigger plan. I was thinking Venezuela or that little area. He was thinking the world. He knows better. Praise God. He is an awesome God. But the house of ease is the one that captures you. The house of ease takes you into an area where you only can do what you can do. And you become a little small vision God. You cannot see past your own nose because you can only do what is easy. <sighs> When we were fighters, all of us were fighters. My cousins, you know, we were all like crazy fighters. That's all we did. I don't know why. We were all Christians, but I guess we were rough Christians. I don't know what the deal was. But we liked fighting. We fought each other. But if somebody touched one of us, we fought everybody else. And there was a whole bunch of us. 
I grew up with more, man, there was about 100 of us, but maybe about 40 or 45 of us were the same age. I come from a very prolific family. There was a lot of kids. And uh, in my whole town, in my whole area, there were only one set of people who were dark skinned like me or darker. But my father is a black man. And my father's family married into black families too. So a lot of my cousins are black. I'm like somewhere confused. You know, half here and half there and a quarter somewhere else. I don't even know. But if you wanted to fight, this is how, how things happen for us. If a fight was on and we were driving by or going by, if we saw a black one in ball, okay, that's us. Let's go. Because it was one of my guys, right? And so we we did was fighting. Well, we had this one kid in the family who was smaller than all of us. All of us were a little bigger. He was smaller. And in, our, in my country, when we went to fight, you got to pick who you wanted to fight. Well, he was the first one that everybody fought. I want to fight him because he was the small guy. See, even in those deals, people are looking for the easy. Now, he was not an easy fight, by the way. He was one of my cousins, too. And no, nah, I wouldn't fight him myself because he was not, you know, when people are like him and they are not necessarily like all powerful physically, then they retort to weapons and things. So we're like, no, we don't mess with him. He's crazy. <laughs> he, no, we, but, but everybody was like, oh, yeah, fight him. And even then, as a little guy, I used to think, wow, everybody wants what they think is easy. <laughs> you translate that into the kingdom. Here I'm not saying go find the hardest thing that you can find and then, then do that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is capture the heart of God. And when you capture the heart of God, you do what he says. And a hundred times out of a hundred, it will be impossible for you. You won't be able to do it. When he calls you, he tells you things you cannot do. And he stirs you in such a way that you are, it is impossible for you to capture that thing. But one after another, after another, after another, after another thing, that becomes the battle. Saul, the king, then sits upon the throne and the warrior starts being a warrior. He cannot fight anymore. He cannot. No, he likes the songs. They want to they sing songs to him. But when they capture him and they kill him, they grab his body and they go to hang it in the house of ease. How do you like that to be your epitaph? He lays. Pastor so-and-so, whose life was snuff because he lives in the house of ease. Whoa. Huh. Door, I'll take five minutes and I'll finish. Door is a town that is right next to this town. I know the border town. His place means generation it means dwelling it means age what manasseh was being told was conquer your generation conquer your time if i were to name this sermon i will call it conquering your time conquering your time what do i mean by conquering your time god has given you a specific hours a specific days at specific times. I was blessed hearing all the healing that happened in the house of God uh, during this time. And I was hearing Ray as he was speaking about that. And there are all kinds of things that have happened to us. And God has given you time. How long do you have? I don't know. I know Nabil Qureshi. I don't know if you know who that is. But that is an apologist who worked for Ravi Zacharias who contracted cancer or had cancer for some time. He passed away yesterday. I think he was 36. Right here in MD Anderson. Survived Harvey, by the way. He almost drowned in his house because he was hooked to machines and stuff. Sent out a, a word asking for people to help him to get out of the house uh, on social media. And people got him out of the house. Passed away yesterday. Young men. There's a bunch of blogs uh, on, on YouTube from him. Uh, he was a tremendous mind, a, a medical doctor, 
converted from Islam into Christianity, hated by the Muslim, hated, because he said that, that Islam was a false religion and Christianity was the real religion. Powerful young man. I don't know why God took him. I don't know. He prayed and everybody who he knows prayed for him. And yesterday he passed away from stomach cancer. <sighs> I read it and my heart was trembling last night. Because I thought he only got 36 years on this earth. And part of those were in a false religion. How long do you have? Conquer your time. Conquer it. You think you're going to live for a long time. Those of you who are older, and I'm talking older, you're beginning to think maybe I won't here, be here that long more. Those of you who are really, really young, you're thinking, man, the time for me to think about that is not now. Manasseh was given this place called age. To say, every day that I give you is a day that you need to conquer. Now you don't need to lay down somewhere and think, what did I do with my life this week? What happened this month? Well, let me think off these six months and maybe I'm going to kind of be a lukewarm Christian and see. Maybe. No, 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 no. Conquer your time. I'm crying out for that myself. I just went through a period of time that I don't think I conquered enough. And I'm crying out and stirring out, stirring everybody who's around me. Our days are numbered. They're in the hand of God. He decided that we're alive today. He decided he has a purpose for your life. I say conquer your time. Conquer it. Stop whining that you're not 20 anymore. We all know. We can see it. It's fine. But there is a season and a reason. There's something that God has for you right now. And those of you guys who are starting out life, there is nothing better than to serve Jesus with everything you have. Whatever you go, represent him right. And whatever you wake up in the morning, ask him, what do you have me for today, Lord? I know I got to go to school. I know I got to go to work. But tell me what I'm alive for. For every day is in the plans of God. God has something for you. Recently, we had all these things that we needed to happen around us in ministry and stuff. And we were making decisions. And this scripture was coming to my heart. I want to conquer my time. Why? I don't know how long I will be here. Maybe because I've been struggling physically for some time. And by the way, I'm getting better. So thank you for all of you who are praying. I've had some hard times this, this last year. But God has been faithful. He hasn't allowed me to stop. And he, he has kept me going. And I'm getting better. Thank God. But let me tell you, it brings something to your own heart. To know that, hey, I got so many days only. And I want to serve him with everything I have. Conquer your time. Conquer it. How do you conquer your time? You count your days. You account for them in the kingdom. One of the things that you conquer your days with is you have to say like Enoch. For the Bible says that for 65 years he, wa- he did not walk with God. And then he had a child named Methuselah. You can read that in Genesis. And the Bible says that for 300 years he walked with God. I tell you something. If you ask me for the number one hero in the Bible, in my opinion, is him. Have you ever tried to walk with God for one week? Where you can say for the whole week every day, I have walked with him today. Have you ever tried it? Have you ever tried to say, okay, God, give me one month. I've tried it. I'm going to try every day of this month to walk with you in such a way that when I go to bed, I can say, hmm, count that one. I, I walk with God today. Oh, try it for 300 years. Wow. Even as a little child, I was like, whoa. And I asked God, I got to say, I want what he had. You know how old I was when I started asking that? I was like seven years old. Even then I understood. I said, whoa. 300 years. I cannot even go two days without getting into a fight. (laughs) This guy is awesome. This guy is awesome. (sighs) Why? Because he walked with God. And if you went to ask him, hey, Enoch, <laughs> how were your days, bro? How were they? He goes, I conquer my age. 
I didn't care that I was 165 or 100 or 65 or 20 whenever I got a hold of God every day. Now, he, was a, he wasn't a sinless man because they, they don't exist. The only one was Jesus. But he was one that every day when he went to bed, God said, boom, he was here. And another day, boom, he was here. And another day, he walked with me, 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 he walked with me. 300 years until God got tired of it. Like, just bring him up here. I mean, he lives over there like, he lives over there like he's in heaven, so just bring him up anyway. He's one of two who went up to heaven alive. Him, Enoch, one of two that went up to heaven alive because he walked with God. Learn to conquer your age by walking with God. Walk with him. How do you walk with him? Make him a part of your day. Not only in your prayer time, dedicate a prayer time to him. Some of you guys do not yet know how to pray more than five minutes. You ask me, how long should I pray? Well, as long as you can. The Bible says to pray without season. But if you're talking about a specific prayer, there is a little scripture or a hint in the Bible that says, could you not pray with me at least one hour? Now, I'm not saying that as a law, but if anybody can pursue something here, pursue to pray at least one hour a day. And those of you who are not into prayer, I'm going to think, dear God, how can I do that? You know what happens when you're not a praying person? You open up your scriptures or you, you, you're going to pray, and you say, okay, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for an hour. About five minutes into it, you're already gone. You're not there anymore. You already run out of everything to pray. You get a list, you go through it, and you're done. But your discipline, if you stay in the kingdom, and you stay in the kingdom, you stay in the kingdom, he begins to stir you up. And those of you who are praying people, please say amen right now. Because you know what I'm talking about. When God has disciplined you to pray, you miss it. You're there, and you're like, okay, I haven't prayed today. I need my hour. Where is my hour? I need my hour. You get cranky if you haven't had it. I can tell when friends of mine or family are having prayed. Because you tell them, hey, how you doing? I said, go pray. Because there needs to be some stirring in the heart and some things that happen in the spirit. Because prayer becomes such an integral part of your life that when you haven't prayed for a couple of days, you have this weight upon you. You're like, wow. Now, we all pray at all the time. How do you pray without season? Hey, you're driving. And, and you're like, you know, praying to God. Sometimes it's a really hard prayer. Somebody catch you up and say, oh, well, praise God, Lord, bless him. Bless him, bless him. Mm. Because otherwise I'm going to send them to you very quickly right now. But there's prayer happening in our spirits all the time. You go to meet with somebody and there's prayer happening in your spirit all the time. This is something that becomes a stage of life. This is what you do. You put a, you put a worship song and you start there again into worship. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? All of a sudden the Lord walks into, you, into your car and you're like all blessed. I really don't like it when somebody very, very Pentecostal is driving. Because when the spirit gets a hold of them, they stop driving and I freak out. I've been with people where, oh, praise God, raise both hands. I'm like, oh, ah, let me praise him with you, but let me drive too. Because this is a little crazy for you. But hey, I know what that is when God walks into your room or into your car. How it is that you conquer your time. You become a man of revelation of, of the scripture. You are looking for, I love the fact that some of you guys are like that. They are so in, in, into the scripture that I can talk to you for hours. And you can easily just jump from one place to another in the scripture. I don't like it when somebody had been six, seven, eight years in the kingdom of God. And you mention a scripture that should be known. They're like, huh? Where is that? Moses, who's that? Wow. How many disciples did he have? Oh. What do you do in church then? And what do you do in your, in your spare time with your scriptures? Jump in there. Get into the scriptures. They're going to wash you over. They're going to clean up your mind. They're going to do things for you. The scriptures are powerful. They begin to shape your life. They begin to transform you. And when you've got time to conquer the age, that's how you conquer it. With the scriptures, with prayer, with seeking God. And God begins to order your steps and order your steps and order your steps. He says, don't go there. Don't talk to that one. Walk in this direction. And all of a sudden, your days begin to take meaning. And when they take meaning, you go to sleep with a smile on your face. You say, God put an asterisk right there because I was here today. I presented myself right here in this place because God has done something awesome. Oh, it is great when you see what God has done. One of my students has a, a big church back in Mexico somewhere. 
And I remember not announcing or telling him that I was coming. I, I remember walking into his church and sitting and usually he was preaching in a, in a, in a language, I think it's Tolteca. He was just somewhere over there by Papantla in Veracruz. And I sat in his church. His name is Reyes. And he was just going crazy in his language, you know, preaching. And he's a little guy. He was whoa, whoa. People screaming, you know, and all this other stuff. It was an awesome time. I was just sitting there just watching him. And he watched me at the end. He goes, oh, that's my teacher. Whoa. And then his sermon got all crazy. Like he was trying to get all homiletical and stuff. He even changed so that I'll understand him. I had to talk to him afterwards. But he come over and we were talking. And you know what I was thinking? I was sitting there. I was thinking, wow. I mean, I spent some time with this young man when he was 19. He came to the school. I remember sitting with him, seeing the struggles of his life. I remember the hours that I was struggling with him because he was trying to get married to the wrong person. He's got a really good wife now, by the way. But I remember that. And I remember thinking at that time, man, this is hard with this kid. And now I sit here looking at him as a pastor. And I think, you know what? This is awesome. Just, you just conquer the age. Conquer your days. And if you take something from today, take that with you. Just conquer what God has given you. What has God given you right now? Your time right now on this earth is yours. It's God's. It's a gift for you. How long do you have it? How long is your brain in the right place? And your, your, your mind and your spirit in the right place? <sighs> Two borders that I spoke about that need to be broken. The, the border that is called the house of ease. That you can only do what is easy. And the border that means conquer your time. Conquer it. And if I were to say something specific in this hour for myself. It's the one thing that I'm trying to do right now. Is conquering my time. I want to conquer my time. Now I can't conquer yours. But I, I am trying with everything in my spirit to conquer my own time. Those of you guys who are struggling with your jobs, your job is really taking a whole lot out of you. I know some of you guys work in really weird hours, weird hours, meaning you work at night, you work in different times, you work outside, or you work in big shifts where you don't really have a lot of control over your time. I just, I'm just asking you, you begin a prayer season in your life where you're saying, God, give me what it is that you want me to do right now to conquer this season and this time in my life. To the pastors, to the preachers here, we've done a lot of stuff in the past, good and bad, but that's gone. This is, this is now. We have something to do right now, right at this hour. Conquer your time. To those of you who have been called to do stuff that you haven't done for some time, come back and do it. Do what God has asked you to do. To those of you who are struggling in your own spirit because there's something happening in your life that is that's dragging you in a different direction, conquer your time. Conquer the season that God has given you right now. I don't even have time to get into what it means to conquer a generation because that's what the scriptures re refers to here. But Manasseh was given this call and he didn't fulfill it. And the Holy Spirit put him in here as an example to say, look at what happens to the person who's not able to conquer the house of ease. That becomes his border. Or his age. Because then that becomes his border also. I just pray that God. To me gives me the ability. To finish up strong. And when he calls me. I want him to call me serving him. So if, it, if I go. I don't want people to say wow. You know he went. But I mean I don't know. I mean he didn't accomplish. I, I, I want to go into heaven. With not having left anything of me down on this earth. I want to be squeezed to the end. That every single uh, iota of my strength or whatever God has given me in, 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 in my own spirit to have laid it at the feet of Jesus. I don't want to be leaving it for tomorrow. I want to give it all out today because I don't really know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. But I do know that I'm here today. What a profound philosophical statement. I'm right here. No, the reality of it is so are you. And this is your time. This is your time because you're here right now. I speak to those who are mine. It's our time. This is right now. We, we're not going to wait two weeks or two months or two years. It's going to happen right now. We have to conquer the time that God has given us. And um, to pastor, I'll say the same. He served the Lord for as long as I can imagine. I think, I don't know, this church has been here, I think, 
You were 19 when you got here, huh, Pastor? That's a long time, y'all. I mean, <laughs> how long is that? Like 30-some years you've been here. Ugh. I would have quit a long time ago. No. Well, he hasn't let you yet. That means you have to conquer your time, right? You have to conquer your time. Conquer this season that God has given you. You guys who are here, you're stuck with us. If you don't like something about us, just pray for us then. Because you're stuck. If God has you here, you got nowhere to go. He's going to make you uncomfortable wherever else you go. So you're going to have to pray for us then that we can do something good here. Conquer your own time. Conquer what God has given you. Those of you who are couples that, you know, you're, you're, you're like, like struggling with each other. Conquer that too. Conquer the time that God has given you together. Really, God is on the move right now. And I believe, I believe that he wants to stir this church up into something powerful. Uh, Ray said it. I mean, we had a move of God right now. I, I thank God for the musicians. I mean, I think that something good is happening. And right now, there was a move of God here, as he said, hasn't been done in a long, long time. Somebody leaned over to me, even while was, this was going on, and asked me, has this ever happened here? And I said, it did. It just happened a long time ago. You weren't here yet. <laughs> That's the deal. Well, it needs to come back. Can everybody say amen? We need to stir it up. We've been mild too long. There's a lot of conquering to do. So... Get yourself some radical inside of you and go after it. We don't have to be any other way. This is the kingdom of God. There's something to be excited about. And as Ray said, if you don't shout, he'll find something else to shout. And if they don't shout, the rocks will cry out, but somebody will glorify the Lord. And we're going to do it in this house the way that God has called us to do. Conquer your time. Conquer it. This is our season and our time. I sound like a coach, right? You know how coaches get in your face? We're going to win. And he knows you're going to get killed. But I'm going to tell you we're going to win anyway. I've been there. You have my coach saying, you're better than that guy. I'm like, no, he's going to the NBA. I don't think I'm better. But yes, I'm going to believe you anyway. No, and, but in the case that I'm telling you, the kingdom of God, the thing about it is our coach, our cheerleader, our very, very, very head is Jesus himself. And he's powerful. Conquer your time. Praise the Lord. God bless you.